Good morning. You're all afraid of the other side of the sanctuary or what? We've got a discrepancy here, I think. So, But it's great to be with you all worshiping in the Lord's house once again. We're in Leviticus chapter 12 today. Leviticus chapter 12 is our sermon text. We find ourselves in the midst of the clean and unclean laws in the book of Leviticus, which I know, you don't have to tell me twice, is the most scintillating section of your Bible reading plan every year. And so Leviticus chapter 11 discussed the uncleanness related to animals, which animals they could partake of in in eating and which ones were forbidden for them. And now we find ourselves in relation to the uncleanness, which is regarding people, our bodies, discharges, leprosy. In particular here in chapter 12, the uncleanness that is related to childbirth, which is interesting to me seeing as how many children we have in the sanctuary today. So it's great to see all the little ones out here. Who knows? Of course, the Lord in his providence ordained this text for today's sermon. And so the title of this message is The Babies and the Birth Waters. The Babies and the Birth Waters. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, God says to the woman, Eve, after her sin, he says, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. I can understand why as a consequence of our sin, and in particular Eve's sin, as God is meeting out the consequences to her for her sin, why, why pain should be issued forth in childbirth. But I don't understand uncleanness, perhaps you might be thinking to yourself as you're reading Leviticus chapter 12. Is that just cruel of God? Uncleanness on top of pain? What is going on here? And aren't children a blessing from God? Aren't we supposed to be fruitful and multiply in the earth and take dominion of it? Psalm 127.3 says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. Literally, an inheritance from the Lord. That word was used of the inheritance that the Israelites would get in the promised land and would divvy it out to the tribes. That's what's used to describe of children here. They're an inheritance, a blessed inheritance from God. The fruit of the womb, a reward. The verse goes on to say, so why then are babies or the birthing process, why are women deemed unclean here in Leviticus 12? Well, before we get off and running too far ahead of ourselves, let's read the text that is before us now, starting in verse 1, and we'll read the entire chapter. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, If a woman conceives and bears a male child... Then she shall be unclean seven days, as at the time of her menstruation she shall be unclean. And on the eighth day the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. Then she shall continue for thirty-three days in the blood of her purifying. She shall not touch anything holy, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purifying are completed. But if she bears a female child, then she should be unclean two weeks, as in her menstruation. And she shall continue in the blood of her purifying for 66 days. When the days of her purifying are completed, whether for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting a lamb, a year old, for a burnt offering, and a pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering. And he shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her. Then she shall be clean from the flow of her blood. This is the law for her who bears a child either male or female. And if she cannot afford a lamb, then she shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. And the priest shall make atonement for her, and she shall be clean. Well, as we look now at our text, I'd like you to notice firstly the uncleanness described in verses 1 through 5. The uncleanness described Look with me at verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, If a woman conceives and bears a male child, a male child is being described here in verses 2 and following, then she shall be unclean seven days. That word unclean is used in the book of Leviticus almost 100 times. It's a very significant word for the book. Now, what does it mean to be unclean? To be unclean means to be unfit for the presence of God. Unfit for the corporate worship of God. Unfit for the pure surroundings of the tabernacle as it pertained to the Israelites in the Old Covenant. Now, this is something that we need to understand also about uncleanness. 
And this is something that I misunderstood when I was reading the book of Leviticus growing up, is that uncleanness does not always mean sinfulness. It doesn't always mean sinfulness. In fact, there are many times in the book of Leviticus that you would be declared unclean for doing something that was a normal, everyday, day-to-day activity. And so uncleanness does not necessarily mean sinfulness, but it is a byproduct of our sinfulness. A picture of the consequences of our sin. For instance, bleeding out and bleeding that takes place during childbirth is a consequence of our sin. We would not lose blood if there were no sin in this world. And you might be also surprised to note that uncleanness, as it was related to childbirth, in making someone unclean, that was not just unique to the Israelites in the age of war. In fact, surrounding communities and societies also regarded women as being unclean after their giving of birth. In ancient India, it says that all relatives of a newborn child and the house itself would be rendered unclean in ancient India when a woman would bear a child. The Hittites, who were thorns in the side of the Israelites, You'll recall that Esau married a couple Hittite women that drove his parents, Isaac and Rebekah, up the wall because of his doing so. The Hittites, they would keep a woman in isolation for the last two months of her pregnancy. And on the seventh day after the birth, a sacrifice would be offered. Three months after the birth, the child would be pure if it was a male, but four months it would take for a female to be pure. This is not unique to Israel. So then why was childbirth unclean for the Israelite? That's the question that we need to ask. Some have said that this could be a pointer toward original sin. Original sin. The fact that that baby is conceived and brought forth in iniquity. In birth, in the moment of conception, did my mother conceive me in sin, David says in Psalm chapter 51. John Calvin writes, For the mother would not be unclean if the children were pure and free from all defilement. Therefore God would by this right teach his ancient people that all men are born accursed and bring into the world with them a hereditary corruption that pollutes their very mothers. Close quote. We bring sin with us into the world, don't we? We're not born innocent. We're born D-O-A, dead on arrival spiritually. Your baby might be cute. But it is a viper in a diaper, spiritually speaking. Parents, you must disciple your children. Your your child is not born morally neutral. Uh, Like a, a messed up wheel when you go to the Walmart on the cart that you're driving through the store. It's inclined to the left or inclined to the right. It's inclined to not go straight. So also are our hearts from birth. And so we must disciple our children, raising them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. In fact, in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses instructs the Israelites, he says, Make known to them these statutes, these commandments. Make them known to your children and your children's children, Moses says. Friends, you never retire from discipling. Whether it be your children or even your children's children. Our call is to disciple to the utmost. You might retire from your job. Your kids might even move out of your house. But the calling to point your children to Christ remains the same. So then what's going on here? I think part of it might be there's the taint of original sin which is being taught here, but also there's something even deeper. There's a loss of blood that takes place you noticed in the chapter. Loss of blood could lead to death. In fact, infant mortality rates were incredibly high in ancient Israel. One scholarly study says that actually six pregnancies it took to produce two children who reached adulthood in the ancient world. It's not a very high percentage. You could die giving childbirth. And uncleanness was linked with death. The loss of blood signified that one was incomplete or unclean. J. Sklar, a commentator, he writes, In many of these laws, purity and holiness are associated with life and wholeness, while impurity is associated with death 
and a lack of wholeness, end quote. Now, some might argue, well, isn't this woman bringing life into the world? Why is she therefore unclean if she's bringing life into the world? I don't understand this. But one thing we also must understand is that she's actually, in a sense, losing life to bring life into the world through her loss of blood. The woman was unclean as a result, and it says that she was unclean there for seven days. A complete cleansing, in other words, must take place if she is to re-enter the covenant community. Minor uncleannesses in Leviticus, they only lasted till the evening time. This one lasted seven days and then some change, as we will see. This is the first step of her purification process. And then notice there, the second half of verse 2, it says, As at the time of her menstruation, she shall be unclean. Menstruation is discussed at length in Leviticus 15, so hold tight for that sermon. <laughs> but as at the time of her menstruation, she would have to be removed from the community... You could not have sexual relations with her. Anything upon which she sat would become unclean. She had to withdraw from the covenant community. Everyone knew that she just had a child. And I think in some ways this might have been a blessing. It was a blessing for the new mother. Getting some relief. Getting some time away with your child. I'm sure for any of you who have been young mothers before, maybe you appreciated the time that you got to spend away from, from people. And there are no pain meds in this day as well, which is something that we need to consider. She was given time to rest and recuperate and enjoy being a new mother. Well, then in verse 3, she was to do something with this child. On the eighth day, the text says, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. Circumcision was crucial for identifying the people of God in the Old Testament. It was a sign of God's ownership. It was a sign of your belonging to the covenant community. God's bought people. And it had deeper spiritual significance as well. It signified a cutting away from sin, undergoing a change of heart, being circumcised in your heart, belonging to the household of faith. Ultimately, circumcision was a sign of salvation. Not that it imparted salvation or the people that were circumcised were automatically saved, but it pointed to saving faith in God. R.C. Sproul writes that baptism is not identical to circumcision here in the New Covenant, but it corresponds to it in its essence, pointing to the same spiritual benefits and has replaced it as a sign of the covenant. We now baptize rather than circumcise, don't we? This sign has been fulfilled in baptism. Baptism is the circumcision of Christ. This is why we as Presbyterians baptize infants also. Babies were circumcised under the old covenant. And it was a sign of the salvation that it pointed to. Now here in the new covenant with the sign of baptism, which points forward to the salvation that can be wrought in God when we place our faith in him, we administer it. To children. It does not mean that the baby is saved automatically, but it points to saving faith. We pray for the saving faith of that child as we raise them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Colossians 2, 11 and 12 is a key text that connects baptism and circumcision. If you need a text to defend infant baptism, in other words, when your Baptist brothers and sisters accuse you of being a heretic, maybe, okay, accuse you of teaching something false, practicing something false, I think that infant baptism has scriptural precedent. It says, In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism. Notice the connection between circumcision and baptism. In which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. This baby was to be circumcised on the eighth day as an infant and the mother was supposed to be obedient to that command as such look now at verse 4 step 2 of her purification process with the male child begins then she shall continue for 33 days in the blood of her purifying she shall not touch anything holy nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purifying are completed literally all the holy objects she shall not touch and to the sanctuary she shall not go. 
until the days of her cleansing are fulfilled. This meant that she could not partake of any of the peace offering, the flesh, that was rightfully hers to eat as a member of that community. She could not partake of that offering. She couldn't go to the tabernacle and worship with the people of God, and she had to remain unclean for 33 days because of her blood flow. Then in verse 5, we see a female child being described in the uncleanness that would come as a result. Verse 5, But if she bears a female child, then she shall be unclean two weeks, as in her menstruation, and she shall continue in the blood of her purifying for 66 days. Now this baby girl is not to be circumcised, as some communities even practice today, which is very dangerous, can be very harmful to the baby. But the uncleanness was doubled for this child. Doubled in every way. Now, some people have looked at this text and they've said, is God sexist for saying that the woman is unclean because she bears a child for twice the amount of length as a, as a male child if she were to bear him? What is going on here? Are women inferior to men? Is God implying that? I read one commentator this week who said that under the Old Covenant, women did not share an equal status with men and the people of God. But now under the New Covenant, there is either male or female, and Jesus essentially ended that. Is that what's going on here? I don't think it is. The Bible is clear that women are not ontologically inferior to men in any way, in their being whatsoever. They are co-image bearers, co-heirs of the gift of life. 1 Peter 3, 7 says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Speaking of, in general, physically weaker vessel. Show honor to the woman as a weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Fellas, you want your prayers to not be hindered as you approach the throne of grace day by day? Treat your wife with respect. Honor her as a child of God. She is a co-heir of the gift of life with you. Why would God listen to your prayers if you're treating one of his daughters with disrespect? If someone came up to you If you were a father of a daughter and someone was disrespecting your daughter and came up to you and asked for a favor, asked for help, would you be inclined to assist that individual? Well, fellas, if we're not honoring our wives, our spouses, the women in our sphere, our prayers will be hindered as we approach the Lord. Women, you have just as much dignity, value, worth, salvation as any man in this room does. Are there differing roles between men and women in the home and the church? Yes. Are there differences between men and women in many ways? Yes. But are there differing values, differing levels of worth between men and women ontologically in their being? No, there are not. And so that can't be what's going on here in this text. We even see in verses 6 through 8 that the remedy that is prescribed to atone for the childbirth of both the male and the female is exactly the same in 6 through 8. It doesn't prescribe a, a lesser sacrifice for the, for the man and for a greater sacrifice for the woman, the young girl that is born. They're exactly the same. And so then what is going on here? Why is the female unclean for longer? Well, there's no reason given, is there, <laughs> in the text. We can only say so much And people like to guess and conjecture at what is taking place in Leviticus 12. But there's no reason ultimately given. And it's also, I think, something we have to be careful of in assuming that the Israelites also knew the rationale behind everything that the Lord did with the clean and unclean laws. If God commanded it, they were to obey. They might not have always understood the rationale behind why he declared one animal unclean and one animal clean or what's going on here in Leviticus chapter 12. I mean, we have that even in our own culture today. We have some traditions that we don't know where they came from. We don't know who invented them. We don't know why we do some certain things in church the way that we do them, but it's just the way we've always done them. And I think that 
may have been the case with the Israelites as well. But another conjecture that people make is that the ancients believed that the blood and water which would issue from a pregnant woman lasted longer after the birth of a female than a male. Could be something to that. I don't know all of the physiology behind that. But another reason, another potential option, is that the boy was circumcised and the girl was not. The boy was included in the covenant community through circumcision, which perhaps sped up the purification process, whereas the female was not. Could be another answer for that. But here's what I think is going on. The mother who was bearing a female child was bearing a child bearer. She was bearing a, a potential future child bearer. One who could bear children and give birth and one who would menstruate and lose blood herself. That's what I think is the ultimate answer for the double uncleanness law in Leviticus chapter 12. It must be noted at this point that being a mother is an incredible blessing, incredible privilege. And I'm sure that that woman who had to carry all of these cleanness rituals out in her life after having a child recognized that and realized that. It was an incredible privilege, but it was also a great responsibility. It was a great responsibility. But don't forget that being a mother, friends, is an incredible blessing also. I remember I was on a second date with my wife back in Wisconsin when we met in 2021. And on the second date, I asked her, what, what would you like to do if you could do something full-time for a living? Money's not an option. What would you desire to do? And she told me, she said, Marcus, I would love nothing more than to be a wife and a mother. And at that point, I was just like, can I marry you now? <laughs> She's out of my league. And I think that's the kind of desire that a woman should embrace. That a woman should embrace. It doesn't mean that everyone is called to be a mom. I'm not saying that at all. But that kind of desire is not to be spurned, but to be embraced. Phil Riken says, not that all women are called to be mothers... But all women should embrace their feminine identity as life givers, which is biologically signified in the capacity to bear children. Embrace their identity, their feminine identity as life givers. I think women should do such. You remember that weird text in 1 Timothy 2, verse 15? Some people call it the most sexist verse in the Bible if you're a progressive, liberal scholar who loves attacking the Bible. 1 Timothy 2.15 says, Yet she, that is the woman, that is all women, she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. <laughs> childbearing was very important for the Apostle Paul. Now, he's not saying there that if you simply have a child, you will be saved as a woman because he says you've got to have faith, holiness, self-control, those kinds of things. That's not what he's saying at all. But what he is saying is that in the midst of your childbearing, mothering duties, you can be saved. You don't have to jettison and get rid of your motherhood duties in order to be a Christian. Just because of the first sin in the garden, because... Eve acted out and grabbed the apple and stepped out from under the headship of her husband just because she did that doesn't mean that you now need to forget your duties as a mother. You will be saved through the act of childbearing, child rearing, through motherhood. It is a good and godly calling upon your life as you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Do not forget that as we read Leviticus 12. Secondly, now I want you to see the atonement prescribed. The atonement prescribed in verses 6 through 8. God provides atonement so that we might be made right with him. And he prescribes a lamb, a common animal, for the woman to be able to make atonement. Isn't it, isn't it amazing 
that God has always provided a means of atonement so that we might be made right with him. Always. Ever since Genesis 3 in the garden, God provided skins for Adam and Eve to be atoned for before him. So also here. God is not hard to find. Not hard to access. You come through his appointed means, you can have atonement and be reconciled to him. So with the mother here in this chapter. Verse 6. And when the days of her purifying are completed, whether for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting. That is important. The woman could come to the tent. The woman can worship with the people of God. They were not second-class worshipers. You sit outside the sanctuary while the men can sit over here and worship over here. They would come in and worship with the people of God. And she was to bring something. She shall bring to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting a lamb, a year old for a burnt offering. Not an expensive animal, a very common animal in Israel. God was not asking this woman to break the bank in order to experience atonement. It was a lamb, a year old, a good, healthy lamb for a burnt offering and a pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering. And he shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her. The priest was to take this animal and sacrifice it for her because he's the mediator. We approach God only through a mediator. In this case, it was the priestly system. He would make atonement for her. Then she shall be clean from the flow of her blood. This is the law for her who bears a child, either male or female. Isn't it interesting that this offering is called a sin offering that she would have to offer? And a burnt offering to make atonement, to cover over this kind of sin. Now we're not saying that she sinned in having a child. We already established that. But she is being reminded of the effects and the consequences of sin as she brings forth this offering. It's a reminder of the first sin in the garden as well. Charles Simeon, 18th and 19th century pastor, he says, Indeed, the very pangs of childbirth remind all who are called to endure them of the first transgression. In other words, every woman who has to bear a child must remember the first sin and the curse that God put upon the childbearing act. And, Simeon continues, as being inflicted on account of sin, they call for acknowledgments of our sinful state. End quote. Do you know, friends, that pain is a reminder of our sin? As Jamie prayed earlier, the fact that there's pain in the world is proof that there is sin in the world. If there were no pain, it would be because there was no sin. But the reason we lose blood, the reason our joints ache, the reason our necks crack, the reason our eyesight fails is because of sin. And Jesus came to solve that sin problem. He came to do away with our pain and eternal bliss and the new heavens and new earth with him, ultimately. He came to do away with it all. In the end. But friends, don't ultimately weep that there is pain and suffering in the world. Weep that there is sin in the world. There's pain because of sin. If you love someone and your heart breaks for them in their pain, share Christ with them in their pain. It's the only thing that can solve their pain problem in the end. Pain is a reminder of our sin. She would be reminded of that when she gave birth to that child and had to bring this offering. But it wasn't just a reminder of sin. It was also an opportunity to her, for her to express thanksgiving to God. For the forgiveness of sin. And also so that she could express gratitude for a safe childbirth. And for the gift of children. The blessing of having a child. How grateful mothers are you when God sees you through something like that? I think if I had to go through that, there would be a lot less babies in the world. <laughs> I, I do not envy you in that, in that regard. 
The children are a blessing, not a curse, regardless of what the world might think of children. What does the world say about little ones? They're money suckers, keep you up at night. They ruin your perfect two paycheck lifestyle. Maybe you should just travel the world, enjoy life with your spouse, put kids off for the rest of your life. That's what the world says about children. I want you to hear a passage from the book of Genesis, chapter 33, when Jacob and Esau are reunited. After Jacob has a bunch of children now, and he hasn't seen his brother Esau in many years. And Esau now approaches Jacob and sees this band of family members that he has now acquired. Listen to what Jacob says about his family. Genesis 33, 5. And when Esau lifted up his eyes and saw the women and children, he said, Who are these with you? Jacob said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. Do you think of your children like that? Gracious love gifts from a God who loves you. Regardless of the amount of pain they might inflict in your life. Can you say with Jacob, these are the children whom God has graciously given me? Your children are gifts to you. The rest of that psalm, which we cited in the beginning, Psalm 127, 3 through 5. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Children help you fight the good fight of faith, parents. They drive you to your knees in prayer. They grow you in grace. They show you the love of the Father in granting them to you. The psalmist goes on, Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. Blessed. I see this when I go over to my wife's get-togethers with her family. She's one of ten. <laughs> Those are action-packed Christmas times. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Ideally, children stick up for you, help you, vouch for your cause. They are gifts from the Lord. Well, then here in verse 8, God makes a concession for the woman who cannot afford a lamb to make atonement for her childbirth. Verse 8, if she cannot afford a lamb, then she shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. And the priest shall make atonement for her, and she shall be clean. The text woodenly reads, if she does not find in her hand enough of small livestock or sheep or goats. She doesn't have it on hand. It's not there. God's not going to ask her to, as I said earlier, break the bank to make atonement for her childbearing. And there are similar concessions for such things that were made with the Levitical offerings in chapters 1 through 7. If you couldn't afford the animal, God provided a way for you to worship. God will always give you enough to serve and to worship and glorify him, beloved. Whatever you have. It might not be much. You might not have as many resources as the Christian down the street. But God will use what you have. If you will commit it to him. Just ask the widow in the Gospels. Donated two coins. Threw them in the coffer. Jesus watched her. He honored her. He said, that woman has given more than all these people combined. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 says, God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. God will make sure that he provides you with all the resources that you need to abound in good works. In good works. Not so that you can merely spend it on yourself so that you might do good for the advancement of God's kingdom and for the good of others. My wife and I have a very small apartment back in Jackson. 
two-bedroom apartment, can't fit that many people in there. And the temptation is for us to say, well, we just don't have a lot of space to host people, to show hospitality, whatever, you're better off going to the house down the road, and then we'll join you over there. Whatever you have, no matter how small it is, use it to serve God. There are people in our apartment complex who do not know the Lord that Say and I have been convicted to invite over, show hospitality to, to practice hospitality for, as the New Testament calls us to do. Whatever you have, use it for the glory of God and he will multiply your fruit for him. Charles Spurgeon writes, Each day, though it bring its trouble, shall bring its help. And though you should live to outnumber the years of Methuselah, who was 969 years old for your Bible trivia phenoms, though you should live to outnumber the years of Methuselah, and though your needs should be as many as the sands of the seashore, yet shall God's grace and mercy last through all your necessities, and you shall never know a real lack. Close quote. Believer, you will never know a real lack as a child of God. He will open up the floodgates of heaven for you to give you the resources that you need so that you might abound in every good work. Do you believe that? This is a merciful concession that God made for this woman so that she might approach him. This not only demonstrates God's love for the poor, but it also demonstrates the extent to which he would one day enter into our poverty, into our experience. The seed of the woman, Christ, would one day be born of woman, wouldn't he? To bear the curse, to become accursed for the woman and for the man who sinned themselves into hell itself to reverse the effects of the curse so that we might enjoy fellowship with him. Galatians 4, 4 and 5. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman. Born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. I want you to see how the fulfillment of the law took place even in Christ's earliest days here on earth, ever so briefly. Turn with me, if you would please, in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2 as we close out this morning. Luke chapter 2, verses 21 through 24. Jesus has only been alive for a few short days. The shepherds have left rejoicing. Mary is treasuring up all the things that were said about her son in her heart. And she's wondering what to do with them. And what she does is she is obedient to Leviticus chapter 12. Luke 2 verse 21. And at the end of eight days, the text tells us, exactly as prescribed. You see Mary and Joseph's obedience on display here. Christ is even beginning to fulfill the law on our behalf before he can walk. When he was circumcised... He was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Do you realize that the first blood that Christ ever shed for you was not on the cross? It wasn't when he cut his hand when he was working on wood as a carpenter. It wasn't when he skid his knee as a kid playing stickball in the streets. The first blood that Christ ever shed for you was in his circumcision. He was called Jesus. Verse 22. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, i.e. the text we just read, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Again, Mary's being obedient to the Old Testament. Exodus 13, which said that the firstborn had to be redeemed by a lamb because God spared the firstborn in the Passover experience. They had to be reminded of that forever. 
And look at verse 24. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Mary offered the sacrifice of poverty. He didn't have a place to lay his head as a man. He became poor so that we might become rich, the Bible tells us. 2 Corinthians 8 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. It's because of the poverty of Christ that you have the riches of heaven, believer. The Lamb in Leviticus 12 points forward to the Lamb of God who was slain for you and was raised again triumphant. So that we might experience all the riches of spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. So that we might be cleansed. Our sin might be atoned for, blotted out, done away with. What did Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, say the first time that he saw him in John's gospel? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who follow that Lamb wherever He goes. And we follow Him wherever He would lead us, resting and trusting in Him alone for atonement and for our spiritual cleansing. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, all of your word is inspired, true, rich, full, edifying, Christ-exalting, humbling. Everything that we need for life and godliness is in your word. We thank you that this text was placed in your word so that we might see Christ. Father, we thank you that we are co-heirs with him. We thank you that you have made atonement for our sins, for our uncleanness, of which Leviticus 12 was a pointer to our spiritual uncleanness. Father, I pray that if there's someone in this room who has not been made spiritually clean in your sight, I pray that they would not leave this room before that takes place. Father, continue to wash us, to cleanse us by your blood. Make us pure so that we might follow wholeheartedly after you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.